Hello, Benyanya Busto. Welcome. Hello. First, would you begin by telling us where you're from? I'm from Spain, from a city called Valladolid. And how old were you when you started studying music? Well, uh, I studied actually playing snare drums, folk snare drum, uh, when I was eight years old. And after that, I got into the official music school in my city, and then I started to play the oboe with nine. You started playing oboe, not clarinet or something else. You started already with double reeds. Yeah. And why did you choose oboe? That's a funny fact. I started playing music yeah, with snare drums because my parents and me and my brother, we used to dance folk music. But then my father also started to play dulzaina. That's an instrument, it's similar to the oboe, but in a folk version. And then uh, his teacher used to play the oboe. So I went once to a concert and kind of liked the instrument. And then when I got into the official music school, then I chose the oboe instead of percussion. When was it that you decided that you wanted to become a professional musician? Well, it's, it was kind of late when I was 17 years old or even 18, because I really used to like the music and so, but I wasn't really sure if I wanted to be a professional musician. And then my brother got into the bachelor in music and then I started to know more about the different professional opportunities that a musician has. And also I started to play in several youth orchestras and I realized that I liked it and enjoyed playing and then I decided to study it also. And where did you go to study? I did my bachelor studies in Madrid in the Royal Conservatoire. And then four years after, when I finished, then I went to Leipzig, that's a city in Germany, because I wanted to specialize in orchestra auditions to get into a professional orchestra. And can you tell us a little bit about what your job is now? My job is to be second oboe, an English horn player in an orchestra. We are an opera orchestra, but also a symphony orchestra. We, we play like each week three or four operas in our opera house, but also once a month or something, we, we play a symphony project. So that's a, actually a really interesting job because it's a mix of opera and also orchestral works. It's really interesting because you don't get bored. You, you get the, the best of both worlds. It's also sometimes stressful, but I think it's really interesting for us as a players because it's not the same to, to play down there in the opera than in, in, in the hall, no? And do you enjoy playing opera repertoire more than orchestral repertoire or the other way around? Do you have a preference? I like the both of them, but I would say as a second oboist, maybe it's more interesting to play in a symphony orchestra. So you're used more as an English horn player if you're playing symphonic repertoire rather than opera? Yeah, and also it's common if you have a symphonic piece, then you will have a part just with English horn. And in the, in the opera, it comes a lot of times that you have to play both, the oboe and the English horn. And that's really stressful sometimes because you have to change. Would you audition for a strictly opera orchestra or a strictly symphonic orchestra after having done this job? I will do both. But playing opera is a much bigger job because operas are much longer pieces, right? You, you have a lot more work to do and you have a lot more preparation to do. What, what is the difference in your mind between preparing, say, a symphonic work and an operatic work? Well, if you are playing opera, that you have to listen to the singers. I mean, first thing is to know the singer parts because a lot of times you go with them and it can happen also that they go wrong or all different that you rehearse and you have to really learn also them part. And also there's more freedom, I would say, no? If you listen one version of an English opera or a German opera, totally different, different tempos, different breaks. And with a symphonic repertoire, I think it's more like standard, I would say. So you can like listen to a recording and then you practice it and it's more or less the same. But with opera, it's really a different world, no? 
you have to be much more flexible as a player when you're when you're playing opera because you have to react to the singers and you have to follow the conductor more strictly, right? That's it. And also, yeah, the, the thing you, you mentioned before, especially here in Germany, we play a lot of Wagner operas and they used to be like six hours long. So you have to really work on your concentration. For me at the beginning, it was really difficult because you have to get used to you know, like six hours long playing with breaks, of course, but anyway, to keep the concentration that long. And sometimes you, you are not playing for, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes. And then you have to be there, count, be ready. And I think it's a nice job, but I would say it's more demanding. So yeah, and also for us, like how to project the sound, it's a different world. When you are in a hole, the hole is made that your sound is coming out. But in opera, you have to work different with the sound because the reference you have down there is not the same. You have to produce another kind of sound. Can you describe a little bit for us what it's like to play in a pit, how it differs from a stage setting? Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is each opera has a different setting. So now, for example, we have played from a Baroque opera that has 12 or 13 players. And we are just two oboes, two flutes. And then, yeah, you have got a Wagner with 80 players or something. So it's a question of space, question of style, question of sound. So it's really a different world, no? Because sometimes we are playing like all the woundswits together in a side. Sometimes we are sitting in the middle of strings. Every conductor also has his own or her own preference. So yeah, it's really, sometimes it's really difficult because for example, in one modern piece, so we are sitting individually and you are completely alone. So you have also to work hard, try to listen to your partners, but also be sure about your, your playing. Yeah, I think a lot of people that aren't musicians don't realize how much of our job involves listening uh, and not just playing or projecting sound, but actually listening, using your ears and how important that ear training actually is to, to all of us as players. Okay, so let's go ahead and you can do your presentation. Yeah, okay. So, um, as you know, in the orchestra, we can find different sections and one of them is the Woodwind family. As you can see in the name, we have wood and we have wind. The wind part, I think, is clear. It's how the, these instruments produce the sound. In the Woodwind family, you produce the sound with a tube and you have to blow through it. You can use a reed, I will explain later, or not a reed, you just with the, with the air, you produce the sound. You have got also a tube and with different uh, holes into the tube, you produce different pitches. The wood part is not that clear anymore because historically these instruments were made of wood, but it's not that true anymore. For example, the flute now generally is made of metal. Also the saxophone is a woodwind instrument, it's made of metal. And yeah, different instruments now can be made of plastic even. So we have five instruments. We have got the clarinet, the saxophone, the flute, the oboe, and the bassoon. But each of them has his own family. So in the orchestra, we can find the woodwind section between the brass section and the strings. We sit into the middle of the orchestra and the leader of the sections, that is the first flute and the first oboe, they are sitting right in front of the conductor that they can see him or her properly and then lead the section. So here you can see how we are sitting. We have got the clarinets into the left, then the bassoons in the second line and in the first line, the flutes and the oboes. Also, this seating can change because it can happen that in a piece we have got clarinets but no bassoons, or we have got oboes but no flutes. It can change, but, but basically it's the normal classical orchestra seating. So also in the woodwind family, we have different sort of instruments and a very different shape of each other because of the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece is the part that you put 
in your mouth or outside, like to produce the sound. We have the non reed instruments that are the flutes, the flute family, that has, as I said before, a tube with holes, and then another hole, and the player blows through it, like you can do into a bottle, and then you produce sound. But we have also instruments that need a reed. A reed is a part of cane that makes the vibration. So we need this hole, but also this reed to produce the sound. Uh, we have single reeds, it's just a part of cane, but we have also double reed instruments that are the oboe and the bassoon. And uh, instead of one single part of cane, we have got two. Two part of cane tied, and then they vibrate into another, producing this sound, this nasal sound that you will listen after. To attach these holes that we find into the instruments, we have got a metal keys, because for us, we have just 10 fingers, so we are not able to attach every hole of the, these keys. Moving one finger, for example, you can cover three, even six holes. Also, what I wanted to say is that uh, the Woundwitz family is so special because each instrument is really different from another. I mean, the, the timber, it's really personal. In the woodwind family, because of the characteristic of the instrument, they are, yeah, also visually, if you, you see them, maybe the clarinet and the oboe are kind of similar, but the rest, they are really different. So this section is really rich. Uh, they are able to produce really different colors, one instrument from another, but also each instrument, it has a lot of different styles and different colors by itself. An orchestra without woodwind instruments will be so boring because the composers usually use the woodwind section yeah, as a melody, but also to, to put colors. A lot of times can happen that you are not really listening to a woodwind instrument or the woodwind section, like a melody itself. But if you take it out, then you will notice because these colors that produce and the composers use to tell some story or to produce some, some image in your mind will disappear. So that's why it's really, I think it's really an interesting section. The first family instrument we find here is the flute family. Maybe it's the most known or the most famous one, but as you see, it is not the flute that you can, you maybe play in the school. The, this uh, instrument you can find in the Baroque orchestra, but not in the classical one. In the classical one, we find the traverse flute. And the traverse flute has his own family. We have got the smallest one down there is the piccolo. And then we have got a really big one that it's a bass flute, but there is a lot of types of flutes, but we are gonna talk just for the two of them that we can find in a normal classical orchestra. So we have got here into the left, the piccolo, and into the right, the traverse flute. The piccolo is almost half flute. It's made of wood. Usually you can also find flutes made of wood, but normally they are made of silver or even gold. But the piccolo is usually made of wood. And it's a, the smallest instrument in the orchestra. It's also the highest because I like in the strings instrument, you have get like the violin small, so plays higher and the basses are bigger, so play lower, no? So uh, the flutes are the oldest instrument in the world <laughs> that produce pitches, but percussion that is older didn't produce <laughs> different pitches, but the flute did and they were made of clay or even made of bones. So it's considered the, the first instrument ever, was able to produce different pitches, different sounds. As you see here, we have got a piccolo player into the right and flute player into the left. And yeah, um, I didn't mention also before, um, in the woodwind instruments, the higher instruments that are this one here, the traverse flute and the oboe, 
they tend to play the melodies. And the lower instruments, like the bassoon, they tend to make it like a bass in the harmony. They can also be soloist, of course, and they can play nice melodies, but usually they are, tend to play different harmonies. But here, the flute used to play the, the melodies. Now, we can listen how a piccolo player plays, how I, that sounds. That was a piccolo flute, and now you will listen standard flute. So you can listen the difference between the flute and the piccolo. The piccolo is much higher. People used to think one player is a piccolo player and one player is flute player. That's not like that. I mean, the, these auxiliary instruments, they are played by the same player. I mean, you have got the solo player usually plays just the instrument, in this case, the flute, but the second uh, used to play also the piccolo. So as I play the oboe, but also the English horn. So here we find the flute player that also plays the piccolo because it's basically the same. I mean, you play it in the same way. Of course, you have to practice on it and blow differently a bit, but it's played by the same person. And now we have the clarinet family. Also, it's really a big family, but the three instruments we can find in a classical orchestra are the B-flat clarinet, is the standard one, the bass clarinet into the right, and into the left, the E-flat clarinet. So again, we've got the standard instrument, a smaller one and a bigger one. As you can see, the, this bass clarinet reminds of a saxophone, but it isn't. I mean, actually the saxophone was created after. So the clarinet is a single reed instrument, as I said before. And then as you can see in the photos, this reed is attached into the mouthpiece and then the player plays on it. Here you can see the three different instruments, as I say, the E flat, the smallest one, the B flat, the standard one, and, and the, the bass clarinet. So, you will hear the bass clarinet playing now. That was the big bass clarinet. As you can see, it's so big, you are not able to, to hold it. So they have to put it into the floor. You will hear the smallest one, the E flat clarinet. As you can see, it's higher, and it's also tend to play like I would say funny solos with this kind of character or also march or something. And now you can hear here the the standard clarinet. And as you can notice, the clarinet is used in operas and in a classical repertoire as a woodwind instrument, but it's also in this kind of music, like Gershwin one, is used like almost a saxophone to play like a jazzy part, because how the clarinet produces the sound can produce a different colors. And now we have got the saxophone. The saxophone is a really special instrument because it's new. 
I mean, it's 100 and something years it was created. And we have got also different instruments in this family, but the ones we can find in the orchestra usually are the soprano one, the alto one, and the tenor one. As you can see, the soprano saxophone is almost like a clarinet made of metal. That's because the creator was inspired by clarinet, but also the trumpet and also the bass clarinet. And he kind of, he tried to make a mixture between these two instruments. And then he developed these different instruments. But the standard one, this alto one, has the shape of a bass clarinet, like a doubled tube. You can find it in a symphony orchestra, but only sometimes. But of course, you can find it in kind of modern music. Also, it's used to put these jesse colors into the orchestra as the clarinet I saw before. But you can find the saxophone in different pieces like uh, Ravel's Bolero. Of course, you will know about this piece. So yeah, but as I said, in a classical orchestra, it's not easy to find them, but they are also woodwind instruments. Then we have got the lowest family in the woodwind section. They are the bassoon family. And in the orchestra, we can find the contrabassoon one, the one into the left, and the bassoon one into the right. They are really long instruments, and uh, they have to be doubled, as you can see. They are not a straight tube, they are doubled tube. As I mentioned, they tend to play more like the harmony, but they can also play melodies. Yeah, the contrabassoon is the lowest instrument in the orchestra. You can think the basses, the double basses are the lowest instrument, but that's not right. The contrabassoon can play lower notes and some of them you can barely hear. And it's kind of funny because sometimes I'll, when I play English horn, I'm near to the contrabassoons and I'm not able to hear, but I, I, I really feel the vibration, no? When, like when you are in a concert and then you are near to the speaker, and then it vibrates, like your body vibrates also. So that's up with the contrabassoon. You can see, as I said, they are folded, but also to, to carry them, you have to divide into several parts, like in this image. So now you will listen how the bassoons can have a melody. Okay, here they have melody, they are playing as a soloist, but here they are making a harmony bass for, in this case, the oboe that is playing the melody. So as you can listen, in this case, they are just the, the woodwind family playing. And sometimes that's happened that like, uh, a lot of people think uh, in the orchestra, the strings always play, always play the melody, and then the rest of the instruments are less important, so to say. But for example, in this case, they are just woodwind instruments playing, and they, they can work as an orchestra itself. So you have the harmony function, the accompaniment function, the melody one. So it's really, they are really an important part of the orchestra. And now we get into the oboe family. Yeah, as you see, it's also really big, but in the orchestra, you just can find the oboe and the English horn. You can see here the reeds I mentioned before, like the double reeds. You have here an oval reed, 
an English horn reed, but also the bassoon ones. As you can see, they are both double reed instruments, but they are really different reeds. You can put a bassoon reed in an oboe and make it sound. That's, of course, not possible. And as you can see, the bassoon and the contrabassoon one are really wider and bigger than the oboe and English horn ones. So the oboe is uh, the first instrument that appeared in the orchestra. Historically, it was used to accompany like the kings, just yes, like a, you can imagine a trumpet, for example, like kind of march music. And then they were attached into the orchestra in the classicism, but they used to play the same voice, the same part as the violins. For years, they were used to make the violins louder. But then the composers realized they can also have a soloist part, a melody part. And then and the classical composers made them part of the orchestra with his own voice, his own part. The flutes, the clarinet, the bassoon, they came after. But the oboes were the first wooden instrument to, to take part of, of the orchestra. And that's why, because of several reasons, but that's why when you go to a concert, the oboe player, the first oboe, will produce an A, and then the concertino, the, the first violin, will stand up, take this A, and then give them to the rest of the player in the orchestra. A lot of people ask why the oboe and why not the flute, why not the clarinet, why even the concertino plays an A itself, and that's it. That's why, as I said before, the oboe was the first wind instrument to be part of the orchestra. And in these years, the strings were not stable at all. So maybe they wanted to play an A, but this A string was only tuned. So they were not able, without a reference, if they didn't have a keyboard or something, they were not able. That's why the oboe used to play a note, in this case, the A, because it's an open string, so it's easier for the strings to take this note and tune. And then the oboes started to play the A, and then as a reference, the concertino takes it and give it to the rest of the orchestra. And you can think, yeah, okay, that was centuries ago, but now they could change it. Yeah, but it's also because the oboe has a really penetrating sound, and this sound is easy to come like to came along. So from the timpani in the back of the orchestra to the first violin, you can hear the sound really clear and like have it as a, as a reference. So another duty, an important one of the oboe in the orchestra is to tune the orchestra. So uh, next time you will go to a orchestra concert, you can pay attention and you will see how an oboe tunes. So uh, here you can see an oboe reed. Reed instruments, the instrument itself just amplify the sound, but you are able to create the sound just with the reed. As you will see, this sound isn't beautiful at all. It's the instrument who makes it how it sounds, but you will see. As you can see, it's just a, like a duck or something, but it's that that makes the vibration. The oboe players and the bassoon players, to make this part of canes vibrate easily, we have to put it on water. That's why maybe you will see that we bring one glass with water and you have to put them the reeds several minutes in there. The oboe reeds as the bassoon, clarinet, saxophone, uh, bagpipes, and any other instrument who plays with a reed, uses a type of cane called arundo donax. It grows uh, in damp soil, so it's often found near a water supply. Uh, this plant, arundo donax, may resemble bamboo, but it's only a related, it's not exactly the same plant. The, the one we used to make uh, the oval reeds usually grows in Spain or in France, also in Turkey sometimes. Most of the professional and non-professional oboe players uh, make uh, our reeds ourselves, which is, I will say, an art, and it's often referred 
it was the most difficult part of playing the oboe because it's really a complex process. First, we have to choose the cane, then we split the tube cane, cut the cane segments to a precise length, pre gouge the oboe cane, gouge the cane, shape the cane, tie the oboe reed blank, and scrape the oboe reed. Uh, this double reed is attached, is tied into a metal tube covered by cork that it's called a staple. And these both parts together form the oboe reed or oboe mouthpiece. This process, as I said, is really complex and really, really expensive because we have to use a lot of different machines and tools to, to make the whole process. So that's an oboe. As you can see here, it reminds to a clarinet that maybe you are more familiar to but you can easily differentiate it because of the mouthpiece. Like, as you see, it's a double reed one. The oboe, the instrument itself, it's made from African walk wood or grenadilla. It is tube-shaped with holes covered by metal keys, as I explained before in the rest of the instruments, and it has a conical bore, which means the oboe gets wider from top to bottom. Uh, this gives the oboe a mellower sound than if it were straight tube shape. Uh, the end of the oboe is furred and is called a bell. Uh, it's mm, just over two feet long and it's played uh, vertically, not, not like the flute but like the clarinet. And you can also confuse with the clarinet because they are really similar but the shape is not exactly the same and the mouthpiece is, is different because it's a double reed. The body of the oboe comes apart in three sections also, uh, making it easier to store and carry. The oboe usually plays a beautiful and long-lined uh, melodies, but it's also able, of course, to play articulated passages like the flute will say and uh, now i will play two uh, famous oboe solos that uh, have different different characters and different articulation uh, the first of them it's uh, from the rossini overture uh, scala di seta and the second one is the opening of the second movement in tchaikovsky's fourth symphony
And the English one, it's the big brother of the oval. It is approximately one and a half times the length of an oval. But uh, the fingering and playing technique used for the English one are essentially the same as those of the oboe. The oboe is typically double on the English one when required. As me, like I have to play in the orchestra, second oboe, but also English one. The bell, this lower part of the instrument, it's different than the oboe one also. It's onion or pear shaped and the other one it's conical and that gives the English horn a more covered timbre, less nasal, closer into the another instrument of the family that it's the oboe d'amour. In the oboe family, the oboe, we can say it's the soprano voice and then the English horn is the, the alto one, it's a, a fifth lower. So, yeah, and also it has another part more than the oboe. It has also these three parts, but has one more, uh, that it's a metal tube called the vocal. And it's attached into the English one in order to produce the, the sound. Uh, it's placed between the reed and the, the instrument itself. The English horn reed is also similar to the oboe, but wider. And the English horn, the instrument as we know now, uh, it appears first in the Romantic uh, works for orchestra, like Berlioz, Cézanne Frank, Richard Wagner, because before uh, Bach used an instrument similar to the English horn, but uh, not the same, that it's called Oboe da Caccia, but uh, the modern one as we know today, it comes first into the romantic works. And now you will listen how an English horn sounds in the orchestra uh, with the solo from New World Symphony from Borjak. Ms. Alba, what combinations are typical for like woodwind ensembles, chamber groups, that kind of stuff? Well, the most typical and representative one is the woodwind quintet. It's made of one clarinet, one bassoon, one oboe, one flute, and also a horn. Because of the horn sound, like it mixes really good with the woodwind family. Also in the orchestra, it's common used. Uh, a lot of times we have got uh, melodies together. But also in this chamber music, it includes the horns, but it's considered like woodwind quintet. We have got also a trio uh, with bassoon, oboe, and clarinet. That's also typical. Also octet with the four woodwind instruments in the orchestra, but doubled, like flute, clarinet, bassoon, and oboe. And then also kind of miniatures, no? Like, and on it or with 10 people, but the most representative is the, um, the quintet. Also, the oboe, we have uh, oboe trios. That's uh, two oboes and one English horn. You can find also a lot of pieces with this kind of group. Okay, we have one question that is, how much time do you invest on reed making in a typical day or week? Well, wow, that's so personal because each one has a system, each one has a, I don't know, also the way you play makes your your reads to live longer or shorter. But I would say like, in general, each oboist should invest at least one hour per day or like four or five hours in a week. If you are really working every day with your instrument in your orchestra as a professional musician, I would say like, and that's just to have enough reads to, to keep up with your normal work and your normal practice? Yeah, 
Also, it, yeah, they are a plant, no? They are allies. So it changed a lot if today is raining and tomorrow it's dry. When it's snowing, it's really difficult for us to play because they get like closed. And so you have to have a lot of different. And then, yeah, also when the hole is really dry, then you can use another one. And it's really, yeah, an art, I would say. All right, another question is, why is it called an English horn? Where does the English yeah. and the horn come from? That's really interesting because rather it's a horn or it's English. Uh, it was a mistake of one translation. It was uh, in, um, in German, they said like uh, Engelhorn. And that was because it was the horn of the angel because it sounded so nice that uh, it was like an angel voice. And then, but the one French thought, okay, this is uh, English. But supposedly it was because of that. And then they said, okay, Engel, Eng English, English. And then now it's named English horn, but it has nothing to do, like it comes from England or nothing like that. It's from Angel. Is it possible to work just as an English horn performer? Can you have a job that's just specifically for that instrument or is it always done in combination with playing the oboe? Well, it depends of the orchestra, but it's so difficult to find uh, just a English horn player that only plays English horn. And that's why what I explained before, you have got pieces with an extra English horn part, just English horn, but generally you have some bars with the oboe and some bars with the English horn. So if you have in the orchestra one, just one English one player, uh, then in this case, he or she has to play the oboe. So that's why in the English one auditions, you have also to be able to play the oboe. And also when you are a child, you don't learn directly to play English one. You learn to, how to play the oboe and after you can get a, an English one. So I would say, yeah, of course, uh, you can specialize. There are really famous solo English one players that maybe if you listen how they play the oboe, maybe they are not oboe specialists, they are English one specialists, but they have they have to play the oboe. But in the big orchestras, uh, yeah, you can have just a solo English horn, it's called. But sometimes they have to play also the oboe, not as a soloist, of course, but yeah. And are there specific concertos just for the English horn? Wh which ones do people learn as they're doing their education and learning English horn? Well, the problem is sadly not much composers has composed like solo pieces for English horn. Like the most known and the most we play or they demand auditions. It's one sonata from Hindemith, uh, one concertino, like one classic one, Donizetti. Then um, there are some oboe players that were also componists and they composed something like Pasculi, one is named Pasculi, but uh, you can count. With, with the finger of your hand. So that's why it's also so difficult to specialize just, okay, I'm gonna just play the English horn. Also in the modern music, yeah, they are composing more pieces, but uh, the English horn solo repertoire is not that rich because it's more one orchestra instrument. Is it because it's a lot younger of an instrument than the oboe? Is, is that why there's less repertoire, do you think? Or is it just that composers don't tend to favor the, the sound? as a solo instrument? Yeah, I would say it's because, yeah, for the orchestra, it, it gives something different than the oboe, but for the solo repertoire, maybe, yeah, I guess it's also difficult to compose for this kind of instrument. Do oboists borrow repertoire from flutes or violins or other instruments? Yeah, actually, a lot of times we do that, but also the composers did that. Because, for example, Mozart, uh, Bach, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, they wrote a piece and in the title you can read like flute or oboe because yeah they are similar range so yeah and now also we do with violin or with flute you have to arrange something because they they get higher but yeah we do uh, actually the most famous the most played concerto in the oboe is the mozart c concerto and uh, it's not clear it was written for flute and after like make for oboe or the opposite but the thing is the flutes played also uh, but in d minor and we play in c minor but it's, it's the same the people says mozart didn't like the oboe so much so he composed 
the flute uh, concerto and after he said, oh, I don't want to compose another concerto, I just put it in C and that's a novel concerto. I don't, we, we don't really know, but it's like that. And also with English horn, because of this problem I mentioned before that we have not that big repertoire, we play a lot, for example, the cello Bach suites because the, the cello and the, and the English one has also a similar range. So we play a lot of things from, from the cellos. We stole the pieces, yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Alba, for being with us today. Thank you so much for your class. Welcome. <laughs> Just a couple of announcements that I want to make. This is actually our sixth master class. The first three focused on percussion, and then we had two classes that were low brass. Videos that are already available are available both on Planning Logic Studio on Facebook and also on the website. Upcoming classes will feature harp, piano, and voice. Once again, thank you so much for all the clinicians that volunteered. Without you guys, this would not have been possible at all. Thank you so much, Ms. Alba. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us. Welcome. Thank you. 